Well, hello and welcome everybody. It's great to see you. I love seeing you. I'm an extrovert, so this is, this is a great day on Sundays to catch up and encourage each other, spur each other on to love and good deeds. And if you're on the live stream, it's great to have you as well. Keep on tuning into us each week by week. It's great. And if you're visiting, it's nice to have you. I'd love to see you again and again and again as well here. Well, love, people love hearing stories, don't they? Or love watching movies. And the gospel is the only story where the hero dies for the villain. The hero dies for the villain. Normally it's the hero killing the villain, vi- victim and the villains. But we're the villains and he's died for us. So it's just amazing that during the week we had, um, we had uh, Valentine's Day and Jesus is our Valentine because he loves us unconditionally. So if you think you were feeling a bit sad that day, everybody's got a Valentine and he's waiting for us and he's written a card and he says he loves you with his blood. So that's great. Let's sing a song. It's called the... um, Let's get it up there. Yeah. It's the chorus of the saved. That's us. So let's sing together. God or is in the sun. All the angels rejoice at his name. All creation sustained by the power of his word and his throne will endure.
Christ exalted is our song Our anthem through eternity Praises rise and break the dawn Heralding his majesty Christ without a rival reigns Over all creation Exalted is our song, the sovereign over everything. Left his glorious throne behind, stepped into our suffering. The hands that shake the heavens rain, reach to heal. had the first Youth Truth, uh, which is the Youth Church church Service, Youth Truth, what a great name, and the youth came up with that, and the youth designed a great logo, the youth did a lot of stuff in the service, so it was a great service, uh, please invite more people to come, other youth to come along, that would be great, someone invited youth, which was great, and they came, well they didn't invite them, they said you're coming, that must be how they talk to each other, and so that was great to see that, so... <laughs> 3rd of March is uh, the next one, so don't miss out, 4.30 here, and it's a great time, so invite people and come along as well. Next one is creating safe spaces. We want to love our children, but not just our children, people that are vulnerable in life and that come to our church and that we need to care for specially, um, and so we've got some training for that, so there's two trainings, but the first training, you can do it at home, or you can do it today at 1 o'clock, so 1 o'clock here in the church... Sorry? It's 12. Oh, it's here, 1. Okay, sorry. It's 12, yes. So 12 at the church, that's just to helpfully remind you um, uh, today. And it's, there's an online preparation, um, and that's what's happening now um, at today, which is good. The next one is we've got connect groups. And so here's the booklet. So if the leaders of each connect group would like to grab from me the booklets, and then you can take them to your group this week. If you're not in a group yet please join a group, they're great. Come and see me about the available groups or if you know the leaders, you can come and see the leaders. There they are on the list there. So just scan that in quickly, one that works for you. Um, 
and head along to that group and they'll have a little booklet for you and you'll be working through Christian Explored, which is a great series looking at the foundational stuff of what Christianity is all about and gives you some good illustrations to share with neighbours or friends or other people how to explain God's Word to them a lot easier. So please join us as we start this week. Now Sharon is going to come up and update us about the, the library. Thanks, Sharon. It's not just me, it's some others as well. Okay, okay, so Ian. <laughs> okay, so wait for the slow one. Um, so, so the library's up and, up and running and has been for a while. Um, I'm just going to give you some general information and then these are three of our avid borrowers and they're going to give you a, a very quick book reviews on some of the books that we've got there. So the location of the library over here in the, the prayer room, um, we've got fiction and non-fiction categories and lots of categories. Um, you probably need to check them out but just an example, we've got bi biographies, devotionals, uh, books on Christian living, relationship books. I even found the other day, found the other day, the five languages of love, which we all know about after last weekend. And there's also the five languages of love of teenagers, so that could be interesting for some of the parents here or some of the teenagers. So, um, so we've got some children's books as well, uh, and there's lots of other categories. So, so come and have a look. Um, you can borrow as many books as you like with no time limit but you need to record it in the pink book. So this is so we've, we've got a bit of an idea. If something goes missing for six months, we, we know who's got it and we can follow it up. <laughs> um, when you return a book, there's a purple basket in there. Please don't put the book back on the shelf because it needs to go into the right category, so just into the purple basket. And um, just on the, the stock we've got, we've actually been given a lot of donations over a period of time. So at the moment we've got three or four big bags of books that still need to be catalogued and shelved and really not enough room to put them. So if you can just hold off on your donations for a while, that'd be great. Okay, so over to you guys. Who's going first? Okay. I'm very happy to recommend the library to everyone. Um, I've used it uh, fairly frequently recently. Sue actually introduced me to the non-fiction part of the library, which I'm, I'm an avid reader every week of all sorts of books. And um, I read at least two books a week and um, run out of books. And I, was, I, I guess I was talking to Sue about that and she said, why don't you try the non-fiction part of the library? And I thought, oh, non-fiction Christian books. I don't know whether I've really any read. I've read sort of Corrie Ten Boon sort of books with a, a factual account of something that's happened. But I wondered how it would work. Anyway, I started reading them and I thought, this is fantastic. Um, and a lot of them are page turners. They're exciting. They're interesting. At the moment, I'm reading Night Bird Calling by Kathy Gold. And um, that's really, she's a great um, authoress. Um, and it really is page-turning sort of stuff, set in real settings, um, historical events, um, and, of course, the characters are given other names for privacy reasons, I would think. But um, it's um, very good and a, a great Christian theme throughout the book, encouraging people to trust in God in trying times. This one's in 1941, and it goes from Philadelphia to the Appalachian Mountains and the sort of lives people lived then with the trouble of war coming up and things like that, their fears and their concerns and also very brutal lives some of them led, particularly in the Deep South and the Ku Klux Klan coming into action there. Um, but an interesting book and um, 
there's a number of Kathy Golk's books there. I recommend them to you. And you'll feel uplifted where you can buy exciting, interesting sort of non-fiction books in regular bookshops. And they're okay. Um, but they're not necessarily uplifting. There's always a theme about trusting Jesus in these books. So I highly recommend them. Thank you, Kay. Good morning. Now, this book is called, it's non-fiction. It's called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, and it's by Nabil Qureshi. And I picked the book up, um, feeling that it might help me understand the thinking of Muslims uh, and might help me to converse with them if God chose them to put me, them in my path. Uh, I found it very interesting that Nabil, although a scholar, knew little of the background of Islam. His beliefs were based very much on what his imam, um, a, a Muslim leader in a mosque, uh, had told him rather than any in-depth study of the Quran. Nabil, however, was seeking more and in God's amazing way, he made a close friend who happened to be Christian. This book tells of his struggles and passion for finding truth and his reluctance, once he had found that truth, to leave Islam and his close-knit, loving family. It was a process which took years, but God kept on leading him to people who were able to lovingly help him on his journey. It's quite fascinating. Although it's not new, this particular edition has new content and reflections from the original text. Thanks, Sue. Well, this one's for all you adrenaline junkies out there. Um, for anyone going through a challenging time, this is a great book to give you encouragement. After summoning Mount Everest alone because his Sherpa guide had become ill and needing to return to camp, ex-US Navy rescue swimmer Brian Dickinson had to descend from the summit on his own. Unfortunately, Brian became snow blind at 29,000 feet, which is known as the death zone. During his descent, he had only partial vision so had to rely on his own strength, his naval survival training and an unshakable faith to see him through. His story shows that God is always in control of our lives. To put things in perspective, there are currently around 200 bodies on Mount Everest. And it's called Blind Ascent. So, so thanks, thanks guys. Um, so, if anyone wants any help in the library, um, unfortunately I won't be there this morning because I'm on morning tea, <laughs> but most other weeks before church I'm there for a while and um, I'd be happy to help you with selections or any information that you need. Otherwise, just go and take a look. I think you'll probably be pleasantly surprised. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon, for all your hard work uh, in putting the library together. Uh, it's time for the kids to head out for Kids Church. So kids, you're heading out these doors over here with the leaders. Enjoy learning about Jesus or learning about God and his plan for the world. And uh, we're all going to stand and sing the song, I Cannot Tell.
Okay, I just invite you to join in prayer with me. Gracious Father God, as Psalm, in Psalm 9, David says, I will praise you. O Lord, with all my heart, I will tell you of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So we too this morning praise you, Lord. We tell you of your tell of your wonders. We are glad. We rejoice because we have an awesome God. No one else is like you. You alone are the one true God who created all things. You gave us all good things to enjoy. You are perfection, but we are not. Forgive us, Father, for our many sins. Thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place that we might live all because of you. We pray that we might never forget the price that Jesus paid for us, Lord. Thank you. You are our king, a king who loves, a king who knows all about us, a king who even wants relationship with us. We thank you. Father, we live in a world that increasingly ignores you, seeking to do their own thing, not wanting you as their king, from world leaders abusing power to people in all spheres of life. We pray, Father, for a great outpouring of your Holy Spirit to woo people back to you. Soften hard, cold hearts that they might know you because without Jesus, we are lost. Help us to be bold in telling the good news of Jesus in our families, as a church here in, Bado Bay, in the Bado Bay community, wherever we are, help us to care enough not to be quiet about our faith, but to lovingly tell people of our hope in Jesus. Father, we pray for missionaries throughout the world, wherever you've placed them. They have an, a huge job. Lord, May they stay focused on the tasks that you've given them to do. May they clearly share the message of Jesus and many lives be born again into your kingdom as a result. We just pray especially for Matt and Beck Henderson in Arnhem Land, serving with Mission Aviation Fellowship. Lord, prosper their work. Use them, Father, as they share gospel truth with those folk up there. And we pray especially for Matt as he recovers from shoulder surgery this past week. Help him as he goes about his daily tasks and that the pain will subside. And Father, we too pray for our missionaries back here in um, Australia for scripture in schools. We thank you for opportunities to reach the kids with the good news of Jesus, kids who would otherwise possibly never hear any teaching about you. We pray for the team of SRE teachers who faithfully go into our local primary and high schools, especially for Mike and for Wally from our church. We pray, Lord, that they'll be well prepared and equipped with all that they need to speak your truth clearly and lovingly into young lives. We pray that you will water the seeds sown and that there will be a harvest in due time. Lord, we do pray for our own church here in Bado Bay. We thank you for our church family with all our differences, but at the same time, belonging together 
as part of your kingdom family in this place. We thank you so much for the Bible, that it shows, it's your word showing us how to live your way. Thank you for our connect groups as we start looking at the Christianity Explored and Mark's Gospel. We pray for all our groups that we will grow in our faith. We thank you for new folk amongst us in recent months. We pray, Father, that they will feel very much at home with us and loved as precious brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we pray for our families and kids, the kids being back at school. Lord, families have busy lives with so many demands. Help them to love and to actively nurture their children in your ways. Lord, we thank you so much for our church library and the excellent range of Christian books. Thanks for Sharon and all the work that she's done in setting it up and keeping it going. We pray that many of us will read and be encouraged in our own lives. And Father, we, we pray for this online uh, creating safe spaces training session after our service today. We just ask uh, for Mike, help him as he leads the group and help those who are part of the group to, uh, to follow and to do well, Lord, in their understanding. Uh, Father, we pray for our church ministries and especially, Father, we think of uh, Youth Truth, um, a little new group. We pray, Lord, it's exciting, and we just pray that um, the young people will grow and that the numbers in the group will grow too, that they will be excited to, to invite their friends and uh, that the group will grow and that will be a, a wonderful ministry to the young people. And Lord, lastly, we, we just pray for the people in our church that are not well lately, uh, quite a few of them, Father, and we pray for all of them, for Jim struggling with sciatica pain, uh, for Mary and Leo, we pray for the healing of her broken foot. Thank you that she's home. And we just pray, Lord, that this, this foot will heal um, so that she can go forward in, in further things, um, possible surgery in the future. But we just pray for her healing. We pray for Ed Simons um, recovering from his so many complications in his slight stroke. We do pray for Suzanne Allender's aged mum in Fairfield Hospital who's very unwell. Just give Suzanne the strength that she cares for her mum as well as the needs of her own family. And Lord, others amongst us, Elizabeth Reed, Barbara Gilbert and Barbara Skorek, help them to feel, feel better each day. For all these folk, Lord, um, Give the doctors great wisdom in treating their conditions. But above all, we ask that they will experience your peace, knowing that you are with them in their health struggles. And Lord, we lastly just pray for Mike as he unpacks another message from Mark this morning. Help him to do that clearly. Help us to listen well and learn and to apply things to our own lives. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The reading today is from Mark 2, 18 to chapter 3, verse 6. Jesus questioned about fasting. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. 
But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This is the word of God. Well, you might like to keep that uh, Bible reading close by. We're looking at God's Word today. We want to understand God's Word. Uh, Keep it close because uh, it's Him who's speaking to us today and we want to listen carefully. So why don't we pray and ask for his help. Father God, we praise you that you are a speaking God. We ask that despite our sinfulness and hard-heartedness, that you would speak powerfully to us today. Lord, please soften our hearts. Help us to be obedient to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it seems like public debate, uh, controversies, they seem to just be part of our everyday life, don't they? And there was a number of controversies last year, as you look back on 2023. Uh, In 2023, we had a business controversy like that of Qantas. Uh, Despite having record profits of almost $2.5 billion, Qantas sacked uh, thousands, 10,000 workers it might have been, and was found by the federal court, the high court, to have done so illegally. Uh, Qantas was then taken to the federal court for allegedly selling tickets for planes that never flew. Qantas also had their boss, Alan Joyce, who you saw a moment ago, get $24 million as salary, despite the failings of the company. It was a pretty big controversy. Another controversy that hit our airwaves last year was this one. Here it is, the voice. The voice referendum to Parliament. I'm not going to say anything more about that controversy. (laughs) Other than there was a lot of passion, there was a lot of debate uh, from both sides of the debate, wasn't there? But perhaps the biggest, the most controversial issue for last year was this one. Here it is, if you're a cricket fan. The stumping of Johnny Bairstow in the Ashes cricket test. Was it in the spirit of cricket? Not if you're from England. Was it a legitimate dismissal? Dismissal? Well, like the Australian commentator Kerry O'Keefe said, it was a legitimate dismissal. He said, you've got to treat that pop increase just like Julian Assange treated the Ecuadorian embassy. You just don't leave it. Because if you do, you'll be in trouble. So many different controversies, isn't there, in the world around us. Today we're looking at someone and something that is by far more controversial than business or politics or sport. Jesus 
was perhaps the most controversial figure in all of human history. So controversial that people who were enemies banded together in wanting to kill him. I wonder if you caught that in the last verse of what Sue read to us a few minutes ago. It said this in Mark chapter six, verse, uh, chapter three, verse six. It said this. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The Pharisees, Herodians, sworn enemies, now banding together in wanting to kill Jesus. It's not like these uncommon enemies are getting together to get rid of an evil dictator. No, they want to get rid of the most kind, loving, gentle human being that has ever walked the face of the earth. Mark tells us that Jesus is being opposed and he's being opposed for the controversies that we see in today's passage. Last week at the beginning of chapter 2, we started to see this opposition to Jesus growing as he forgave the sin of a paralysed man and then healed him. And at the heart of that opposition was this huge misunderstanding of who Jesus is, a complete misunderstanding of what he has come to do. Last week in chapter 2 also we saw Jesus being opposed by the Pharisees for eating with who? Tax collectors and sinners. Jesus told us that he'd come for the spiritually sick people who recognise their need of forgiveness from God. In today's Bible reading that we're looking at today, the, the controversies, the, the opposition towards Jesus, it continues to step up even further. As we read about this fasting controversy at first, we see Jesus and find Jesus talking about a new era that has dawned. It's point number one on your outline if you're taking notes. Let me read from verse 18. It says this, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not Fasting was something that was commanded in the Old Testament. Uh, God had said to his people, you must fast once a year on what was called the Day of Atonement when sacrifices were made for the sins of the entire nation. So fasting as an expression of mourning over your sin was a good thing. As time went by from what God had commanded, the people of Israel used fasting more and more as an expression of Uh, of their desire for the nation to repent of their sin. So by the time of Jesus, fasting was a religious ritual that was practiced regularly by people who were saying, God, my prayer and fasting is a desire, an indication of my desire for you to intervene in history and to save our people. So people like the Pharisees, they were right into fasting. It was a good thing to do, they saw. Also, the disciples of John the Baptist, they were doing exactly the same thing. So when these people are coming to Jesus, they're saying, Jesus, why do your disciples not fast? (laughs) What they're saying is, why don't you follow normal religious convention? Why don't you, your disciples, express their religious commitment the right way? Jesus answers them by saying, that a new era has dawned because the bridegroom has come. Have a listen to what he says in verse 19. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. I'm sure most of us have been to a wedding. It's a long day. But in the days of Jesus, the wedding feast went for even longer. It went for several days. It was a glorious event. Lots of singing, dancing, as well as a feast of food and drinks. So fasting at a wedding, it seemed a contradiction. And the highlight of the wedding in the days of Jesus was actually the arrival of the groom, the bridegroom. Now that might seem strange to our ears because what's the focus of the wedding? The bride, and in particular, what she is wearing. How much conversation goes into that part of the day. It's amazing. But in Jesus' day, the focus was on the groom. And when he arrived, 
the party was in full swing at that point in time. So Jesus is saying his disciples don't fast because Jesus is like a bridegroom with all his friends. It's not a time for fasting. So to understand what's really going on here properly, this connection, we need to understand a connection to the Old Testament because this image of a groom was actually used by God himself to talk about his relationship with his people. You see, in the Old Testament, it talks about God being the bridegroom who's wooing his bride, his people. So here in Mark chapter 2, we find Jesus answering this question about fasting by saying, I am the bridegroom of the Old Testament. I am God himself who's come here to woo his people to bring you back to me. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus is using a debate about a religious ritual to what? Make a point about who he is. Jesus is saying to the people, I'm the beloved, I'm the bridegroom, I'm here at last to rescue you. So that's why fasting is completely inappropriate when Jesus is around. But Jesus says more in the following verses. Have a listen to what he says, because he's actually saying, I'm the bridegroom, but you've got to wait for the wedding. Verse 20. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. I think Jesus is talking Uh, referring to his own death on the cross at this point. And in that sense, when he dies on the cross, Jesus is taken from his disciples. And at that point in time, the bridegroom, when he goes, the party is over. The disciples will be sad. But in many ways, we Christians, we Christians who follow Jesus, who love him as the bridegroom, we know that we've not yet experienced the full joy of the wedding as God's people. Jesus has done what's necessary, of course. He's done it on the cross. He's done what's necessary to rescue us. But there's much, much more to come. Jesus himself spoke of that time when he returns. It'll be like the wedding of the groom and the bride of his people. It'll be complete when he returns. But in the meantime, there's waiting It's waiting and there's a mixture of joy and sadness in this period of waiting, isn't there? There's joy at knowing this bright future that we have in store. There's joy in knowing that we want to do what pleases him, but there's sadness as well, isn't there? Because we live in a broken world, a world that's racked by pain and our daily experience of struggles and that's the normal Christian experience, isn't it? Joy and sadness at the same time. Can I say, if we're experiencing pain, if we're experiencing brokenness, can I urge you at that time, at this time that we all go through, to keep trusting Jesus. Look to him as the bridegroom. Keep trusting that Jesus will come. He will fulfill his promise that one day he'll take us to be with him. Yes, a new era has dawned. The bridegroom has come but we're not there completely yet. Jesus goes on in verse 21 and 22 to use two images from the world of sowing and home brewing to make a simple point. Verse 21, he says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old and make the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. In Jesus' day, wineskins were goatskin and they were sort of um, folded up so they could be soft and expansive as the wine fermented with the the gases uh, that were expanding. The trouble is that those wineskins grow old and brittle. So if you put new wine into already expanded brittle wineskin, when the wine ferments and the gas comes out, there's no flexibility in the wineskin and boom, (laughs) the whole thing explodes. Your wine, the wineskins, it's all ruined. 
It's the same kind of thing with uh, a patch on your ripped jeans. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying he is not just an add-on to Old Testament religion. He's not just another prophet who's come along to to start a renewal movement in Judaism. No, Jesus is starting something radically new. He's coming to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament and he's coming to bring in a new age when God is with his people, when that relationship is full, when complete forgiveness is possible. In a way, Jesus is saying, Don't just squeeze me into your old system. I can break the power of sin. I can transform you, not just a wiping of the slate clean. I can change you. I can transform you. I can give you a new outlook, a new way of looking at things. In short, I can give you a new life. That's what really riled his opposition. John Newton, he's familiar to many of us, as the author of the hymn, Amazing Grace. Before he wrote that hymn, he was a seaman. In the 18th century, being a seaman was a tough trade. Uh, What little Christian teaching John Newton had as a boy, he pretty quickly pushed aside to live a life that shocked even his fellow seamen. He was a slave trader, trader. He enjoyed all the sordid privileges that that trade allowed. He abused men and women in his charge and he was known for his wild living and exceptional profanity. And not only did he deny the existence of God, he encouraged others to do the same. And even by 18th century standards, John Newton was a pretty terrible character. So what happened to John Newton? that he would write a song that we still sing today with the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. One day in a terrible storm, he thought he was going to die when he was at sea. And all of a sudden it came to him that the way he was living was wrong, that he needed a mighty saviour. He needed someone to step in to take his sins away so he could be forgiven. He knew he needed Jesus. And that moment changed his life. In humble repentance, he came to Jesus. And Jesus completely transformed him. The truth that Mark is showing us is that Jesus is the person who transforms lives. Men, women, boys, girls. He transforms our life by giving us his Holy Spirit. You see, when we give Jesus the the keys of our lives, we're never the same. To follow Jesus is not just to say no to an old way of self-centeredness, but it's actually a way of saying, I'm now going to submit myself to Jesus and have a life of Christ-centeredness. And the wonderful thing is that Jesus has the power to change our lives. Jesus transforms Levi, the tax collector, who we met next week. Jesus can transform John Newton. And Jesus can transform you and me. Be assured, Jesus Christ can give us the strength We need to carry on in that battle against sin and temptation. The next episode that we find Jesus uh, going through in this passage is Jesus and 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 the Pharisees are talking about the Sabbath. It's the Jewish day of rest. Uh, Look at how this discussion starts in verse 23. Uh, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, Why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? What's going on here? Well, God had given the Sabbath as a gift to the people of Israel to make sure they didn't work seven days a week but worked six and then had a day off. For Jews, this day off was Saturday. The Old Testament was fairly loose about what counted as work. So the Pharisees, in their desire to uh, do what was right, they added 39 more laws to work out what work was and what work wasn't. So this included things like this. 
you couldn't sew once you couldn't sew more than one stitch on the sabbath you couldn't untie or tie a knot and you couldn't walk more than 800 meters they were all the sabbath laws they had or some of the sabbath laws they had and one of those extra laws was you can't reap or collect grain on the sabbath and according to the pharisees jesus disciples they were reaping they were plucking grain and they were doing it on the sabbath so how does jesus respond you could kind of think jesus would respond by saying probably how we would today you pharisees you're talking rubbish you kind of think that's what he'd say but instead he tells a story a rather curious story about king david israel's most famous king he says this in verse 25 he says have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need in the days of Abiathar the high priest. They entered the house of God. They ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful for only the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Did you notice there how Jesus says to these Pharisees, he says, have you guys never read this story in the Old Testament? It's interesting. It's a bit like saying to an English literature scholar, have you ever come across Shakespeare before? <laughs> of course they have. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 21, when David is on the run from King Saul, just before David himself has become king. There's a bounty on David's head. David and his men are desperate in their need for something to eat, so they come to the tabernacle. They ask the high priest, can they have some of this consecrated bread? It was technically illegal, fit only for the priests. But David takes some and eat. So what's the point of the story? Jesus used this story of David to make a point that human need is much more important than religious ritual. Yes, David was technically wrong, but Jesus says to these Pharisees, you might be great experts in the Bible, but you've missed the point. The whole point of God's law was to enable you to live. The laws were not meant to be a burden on you. They were not to stop you from eating when you're hungry. Jesus goes on in verse 27 to say to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You see, God created the Sabbath not just as a period of inactivity, but as a time to enjoy God's presence, to enjoy being in relationship with him. And those Sabbath days were designed by God to remind us that there's something more important than work, that we were made to have relationship with God. So when the Pharisees burdened people with laws concerning the Sabbath, They've missed the point. They've missed the point that the, the laws, that the Sabbath were not to burden people. The Sabbath was given to people to remind them that God is offering precious relationship with him to his people. The details here can confuse us. But the point is that you and I are made for rest. That is, you and I were made for relationship with God. So if at the centre of our life is something other than the living God, then we've missed the point of human existence. If work or sport or family or relationships or our personal happiness, if any of those things is more important, the most important part of our life, then we've missed the point of life. So a key question we all need to ask ourselves today is this. Am I in relationship with Jesus Christ? Is he at the centre of my life? If Jesus had finished the conversation there, it would have been powerful. It would have been provocative. But Jesus actually goes a step further. Listen to what he says in verse 28. He says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Jesus is using two titles that describe him in a staggering way. He says he's the Son of Man and he says he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Two titles that point 
to who Jesus is. That title, Son of Man, it comes from the Old Testament, from Daniel chapter 7. Daniel has a dream about a Son of Man character approaching the very throne of God. And this character has the attributes of God, authority, glory, sovereign power. Everyone worships him. His kingdom extends in authority for all eternity. And Jesus says, I am that Son of Man. I am the one who will return in judgment. I will gather everyone, all of humanity before me and everyone will bow before me. So Jesus is saying, I'm in charge. And if that's not enough, Jesus then goes on to say, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, he is the God who invented this gift of Sabbath rest. Jesus is saying, I'm the one who can give you rest. I'm the one who can give you relationship with God because I am God. In chapter three, we find Jesus in front of a synagogue one Sabbath. Jesus is gonna prove that he is Lord of the Sabbath because on this Sabbath, Jesus encounters a man who has a paralyzed hand. And the Pharisees, they're, they're looking in their hostility on this Sabbath day to accuse Jesus. And we read this interaction that Jesus says to them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. What do they do? They remained silent. Well, we all know the answer to that, don't we? Of course, it's right to do good. The Pharisees knew that answer. They remained silent. So what's the response of Jesus to their stubborn refusal to respond? Have a look in verse five. He looks around at them in anger. And deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Jesus is making it clear to all those in front of him by what he said and now what he's done, that he is God in human flesh. That's what got these Pharisees so angry. That's why in chapter 3, verse 6, they end up wanting to murder Jesus. They didn't think that Jesus fit with their ideas. So they rejected God. They refused to submit to him. Uh, Since the death of Queen Elizabeth, there's been some lovely stories emerging about Queen Elizabeth. Uh, One was a story that I came across recently of Queen Elizabeth at her royal palace in Sandringham. And the Queen happened to be walking through the village, not that I would have imagined she does that too much, but on this occasion, maybe looking for a little bit of freedom, she was walking through the village and she visited a shop in the village. A tourist was in this shop buying some mugs, having visited the area, and he saw the Queen, he saw the mug, and he said, you look remarkably like the Queen. To which the Queen replied, how very reassuring. (laughs) Here was a tourist who missed the reality of who was in front of them. That's exactly what the Pharisees are doing. They missed who was in front of them. And that's very easy for you and I, for us to do the same thing. We miss the point that this Jesus is the Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath, God himself, and he has demands on our life. Sometimes it's easy for us to be like the Pharisees, to reject Jesus, because what society thinks, what the world thinks, doesn't fit in with what Jesus says. Maybe it's the area of gay marriage. Maybe it's the area of faithfulness within marriage. Maybe it's the area of loving your enemy. Sometimes we can't get our head around what Jesus says, so we, just like the Pharisees, we can reject Jesus and say, no, thanks, I don't want you. Are we any different to the Pharisees if we do that at that point in time? You see, Jesus doesn't have to fit into our ways of thinking. We need to fit into his way of thinking. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at a number of different episodes with a controversial Jesus. Mark's point has been very simple. This Jesus that we're looking at here, he is God's rescuer. 
He is the one who can cure us of our problem of sin. He is our God. He is our saviour. Mark's been showing us that Jesus needs to be the centre of our lives. The danger for many of us as people who go to church for years, who read the Bible, is that we can just be like the Pharisees. And we can think that our religious practice, that our rituals are actually what ends up pleasing God. So, for example, we can think that reading the Bible, uh, that exercise we do, is something that we tick a box and that will impress God. But when we read the Bible, rather than ticking a box, we should be seeing that the Bible is bringing us face to face with the living God, his very words to us. Sometimes we think, yeah, prayer, it's important. I'll give a few seconds of prayer to God. I'll just dump a list of stuff that I need done before God's feet. Instead, we should see prayer as, as a time of real dependence on the living God, the all-powerful, sovereign creator of this world. Sometimes we think coming to church, coming to connect groups, it's going to impress God. It's going to impress other people. Instead, we should see our time together as an opportunity to hear God speak to us through his word, to spur one another on, to keep trusting Jesus, to live for him day by day. You see, it's easy for our Christian expressions of religious practice to become an ends in themselves rather than a means of grace that God designed them to be. So what should our response to Jesus be? Can I suggest it should be one of joyful love? It's worth asking ourselves the question, is that joyful devotion to God maybe gone cold in our lives? I'm not saying that we've given up on Jesus, that we've stopped reading the Bible or coming to church, but I wonder, is our love for Jesus not like it once was? This week I came across a story about how many marriages of more than 20 years or why marriages of more than 20 years were failing. One of the biggest causes of marriages that last for more than 20 years to end up breaking up was passive neglect. Jesus, people just not being loving or committed to their spouse anymore. And I sometimes wonder, are we treating Jesus with a passive neglect. Perhaps we're treating Jesus like that old friend who we're not very much in touch with. You know, sure, we pick up the phone, we send an email, a text message, the relationship is going to carry on, but actually, we tend to take the relationship for granted. I wonder, do you and I, do we do that with Jesus? We might say that we love Jesus, but the depth of our love, our passion for him, it just kind of ambles on day by day. Maybe that's something we need to confess this morning. Maybe that's something we need to repent of. We need to ask God to fill us with a fresh love and joy at knowing Jesus. Let's be people who follow Jesus and love him all the days of our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portrait of Jesus that we've been looking at today and over these past few weeks. Lord, we ask you to please help us to submit to Jesus as the Lord of our lives. We know we need his forgiveness as our saviour. We need his cure as our doctor. And we need his love as our bridegroom. And Lord, we need his rest as our God. Please help us to submit to him in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish by singing a song, Jerusalem. It talks about the life of Jesus that ultimately uh, culminates in his death and resurrection and that life-changing, that world-changing event. So let's stand and sing this song, Jerusalem.
Today we looked at about two main controversies. One was about eating too little. The other one was about eating too much on the Sabbath day. So it looked at fasting at first, didn't it? And it said, imagine you going to a wedding and there's no food there. You'd be thinking, what's going on? We're, we're supposed to be celebrating here. The bride and the groom's here. Let's celebrate. Well, the groom is Jesus and he was with them and they were supposed to celebrate. Even at the end of time, guess what? There's going to be a big wedding banquet because the bride and the groom, us, the bride and the groom, are going to be there together. And also about the Sabbath. He was created for rest. He was created us for rest in him as well. So we are to go to him for rest. Don't go to other places or people for rest. Ultimate rest comes in him. So as you go and have morning tea, just reflect on those things uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.
shall see.